the countdown. Okay, yes, we're live. We're live now. Yeah. All right. Uh, let me double check on my page. As everyone knows, I always do that. <laughs> I trust. I leave. There we are. I leave nothing to chance. <laughs> well, all right. We are live. Hello, Facebook people. Um, I'm Mitzi Soretto, and we're back again. Yes, you don't. You, like, as I said last time, you don't get rid of me that easily. Uh, uh, I'm here today uh, for. Our, the best new true crime stories, serial killers. And I am joined from the UK, the beautiful United Kingdom, by my contributor, Martin Edwards. Hi, Martin. Hi, Mitzi. Hello, everyone. Nice to be with you. Oh, so how are you? Are you waiting? Uh, you, you're in the evening now, right? Yes, it's uh, just uh, just seven o'clock here. It's it's been a pleasant day. It's getting a bit chilly now, but, um, but it's been dry. Uh, we had a very wet week last week, so uh, yeah, life is uh, good in the lockdown, really. So far, so good. <laughs> summer solstice, just as well. At least we just yeah. had the summer solstice. Yeah. yeah. I hope I, yours I, was I, better I, than mine. Ours was all grey. <laughs> Yes, well, last week wasn't great, but uh, but the forecast for this week is uh, we're going to get a mini heat wave by British standards. So uh, got to make the most of it when it comes along. Yeah, I hear too. I'm not that fond of heat waves. I, I went the other day, I took my famous bear Teddy out strawberry picking and I, I thought I was going to have a stroke. <laughs> it was really hot. I came home, I, oh. my face was totally flushed and oh. my, neighbor, my neighbor saw me. She says, oh, you got some sun. I said, no, I think it's heat stroke. <laughs> <laughs> All this for strawberries. I could have just bought them at the supermarket. <laughs> Uh, well, anyways, uh, I wanted to uh, give you a big congratulations. You um, you have won uh, dagger awards before from the Crime Writers Association, but this time you got a diamond dagger. Yeah, very very honoured, very privileged, very uh, very excited about it. Yeah, yeah. The news came out just before lockdown, so uh, yeah, it was great uh, and and hugely hugely privileged. And, and for those people who aren't aware of what that's for, what what is the the diamond actually awarded for? Well, it's it's the British Crime Writing sort of Lifetime Achievement Award. It's uh, the equivalent in the states is the Mystery Writers of America Grandmaster Award. So um, so it's said to be for. Um, for a career of sustained achievement. So um, uh, there are many famous writers who've won it over the last uh, 30, 40 years. Uh, P.D. James, Ruth Rendell, uh, Colin Dexter, Lee Child, Frederick Forsyth. Uh, so, uh, so it's really rather fantastic to be in that uh, elite company. Yeah, I was just going to say those those are some heavy hitters there. Yeah. So I guess all that hard work's finally paid off, right? Yeah, yes, absolutely. It's, it's taken a long time, but uh, very, <laughs> very, very uh, rewarding when uh, when the news finally came. It was uh, yeah, it was it was a great, great joy, great surprise, uh, but uh, but a great thrill. And uh, I'm still still coming to terms with it, really. <laughs> so uh, so excited. You yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Didn't really happen. Then uh, I just yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and then yeah, I woke right. up. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that, that's a danger. <laughs> it was all a dream. Yeah. It was all a dream. Remember that cop out in the movies where it was some, absolutely. you know, there was a, yeah. it was all a dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when they don't know how to end something. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But uh, but so far I've not woken up, so I'm enjoying it. That's good. Well, listen. I think I think if either we're both sleeping or it really did happen, I, I think. <laughs> well, congratulations again. That's so cool. Thanks, Mitzi. Thank you. Um, well, anyways, I have, uh, Martin is here to talk about the story he wrote for the book, which is called "The First of Criminals." Uh, now, this is a story about the notorious Dr. Harold Shipman. Uh, yeah. Harold was a very prolific serial killer. Uh, first, let me ask you, what made you decide to choose Dr. Shipman as your subject? Well, the case fascinated me. I, I remember it vividly because um, I live in Cheshire in the northwest of the United Kingdom, northwest of England. And um, uh, also in Cheshire, until the boundaries of the counties were reorganized, was a small town called Hyde. It's about a 40 minute drive from where I'm sitting right now. And uh, Hyde was uh, a, 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 and is a small, uh, it's an old cotton mill town from the days of the Industrial Revolution. And um, that was where Harold Shipman was the local doctor 
he was in practice in Hyde for many, many years, and that's where he committed all his uh, all his crimes. So it was partly the proximity uh, that, that I, I I know the area that, that he uh, he lived in and, and knew himself, and it was part of the sheer staggering scale of of his career of crime. It was it was quite and is quite breathtaking. Uh, they think that the numbers will never be definite, but but the the consensus from the public inquiry that uh, was launched uh, after his uh, conviction is that he killed uh, around 250 people, but possibly more. And by any standards, that's uh, just a, an astonishing and mind-boggling number of people. Uh, and so it's that sh the sheer audacity of those crimes. And the fact he got away with it for over 20 years. And he was a respected <laughs> figure. Uh, you know, Dr. Crippen, very famously, may or may not have killed one person. Uh, and he became a notorious figure. But Shipman, 250 is, is just quite astonishing. So it was that combination of things, the fact that I, I knew the, the area and the fact that the scale of the crime was so extraordinary that uh, it, it's very difficult to come to terms with and and when you you contacted me about the the book i thought this might be a an opportunity to explore it in in more detail and, and uh, uh find out some things that had intrigued me as uh, as, as a local resident yeah well i mean exactly i mean th this it is almost beyond belief that yeah. that this man yeah. was was going at this um uh as, as far as so in 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 this in your piece you you go back into his past before he became the friendly local gp yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that you wish you never had yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so, so you're in your piece. You you seem to trace where he may have started his career when he was doing his residency. Am I correct? That's that's right. This was something that wasn't known to begin with, and it didn't really feature in the trial. It was really something that came out of the the inquiry. There was a very very extensive inquiry. I I, I know someone who was involved with it and, and the sidelines and um, a huge amount of resource was put into trying to find out how many victims there actually were and oh and a number of different reports were issued and the more that um, Dame Janet Smith very distinguished uh, 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 person who uh, led the inquiry the more that Dame Janet dug into the facts the more she became convinced that his career of crime had begun earlier than anybody had realized. And this takes it back into the first half of the 1970s. That's that's just beyond belief. That's just uh, so 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 we're talking about then perhaps from the early seventies through uh, when did this all finally come to an end? Nineteen ninety eight. Um, he was arrested. He was tried. He was convicted, and then he um, took his own life in prison. Uh, so uh, uh, just before his fifty eighth birthday, if I remember rightly, so he's fifty seven. Uh, and he'd spent uh, the previous, what, 24 years on this um, extraordinary homicidal career. Uh, so he'd begun relatively, relatively young uh, and, and been very consistent about it. There were one or two breaks, short, shortish breaks. But, um, but of course, 250 people over uh, uh, 20 odd years, it's even the at an average rate, it's uh, it's about ten a year, and in some some years there are many more than that. So quite quite astonishing, quite astonishing. <laughs> also, the fact is, we're, we're talking about a, a, a doctor. This is supposed yeah. to be the trusted person. This is who's <laughs> supposed to heal you. They take this yeah. oath to heal you, and yes, yes. He, well, it's exactly right, Mitzi. And he was said to be the, the best doctor in Hyde. There were other <laughs> doctors, but uh, he, he was well, well known in the uh, community. He, he was a sole practitioner for most of his career. He had been in a partnership, but he'd fallen out with the other partners. And you can see with hindsight, it probably suited him to be in practice on his own. He could, he could uh, 
get away with more, if you like, uh, when he was on his own. And he built up a, a practice of very, very loyal patients who swore by him. Uh, and indeed, I, I think it's right to say that there's some people, even after he was uh, arrested and convicted, who simply couldn't believe that their GP, who they, they trusted for many years and liked, uh, uh, could be could be responsible for, for such terrible uh, death rate. Uh, so, was, so when he was with his partners, did he actually uh, commit any uh, murders at that time? Yes, it, it, it seems that he did, and he he began before then. And one thing that I, I think, with again with hindsight, is very interesting and very instructive, is that uh, in the seventies, he was discovered to be addicted to a drug called pethidine. And he was actually charged and convicted. He had a criminal conviction for the use of this drug. And um, you would think that that was quite a, quite a warning sign, quite an alarm bell. But in fact, he, he was, to cut a long story short, allowed to continue in practice as a doctor. I, I don't think that communications were as good as they should have been. Uh, the uh, uh, medical authorities were probably more lenient than with hindsight they wished they had been. And so he was allowed to carry on as a doctor. And it, it may well be, we don't know, it may well be that this addiction to the drug continued. He certainly used drugs uh, as part of his modus operandi as a murderer. Um, and one of the things I find very fascinating in Dame Janet's uh, report, which incidentally is available on the internet. You can, you can read it in full. It's, there's a lot of it. It's not yeah. very long. But, um, but uh, so, so my contribution to your book is a, a sort of uh, easy version of it, easy if you like. Um, but, Dame um, Janet's um, easy version. Yes, I'll try the digestible version uh, because there are many, many different reports and very, very lengthy. But, but Dame Janet makes this very interesting observation that she, she wonders if having spoken to numerous psychiatrists, he was actually addicted to committing murder as well. He had an addictive personality, showed up in his drug use, and maybe the, the murders are, are another facet of that, which again, I think is, is frightening, and it's also very thought provoking. Yeah, that whole thing about being addicted to murder, I mean, it certainly, it certainly sounds plausible, I mean, yeah, I don't know I if that's really been very explored, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with other types of killings. I mean, I, I mean, you have to admit, most serial killers haven't racked up this number of bodies. This well, yes, that, that's right. And of course, given his, uh, his suicide, we'll, we'll never know. Yeah. But, um, but the, the psychiatric commentary in the reports is, is interesting. And as, as you rightly say, that this this notion of, of addiction to murder, the, the feeling that he's done it once and so he can get away with it, 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 it yeah, it becomes quite Moorish. Um, and uh, and he continued to get away with it. It was it was quite astonishing um, because Hyde, as I say, is a relatively small town, relatively small community, and all these people were dying. Uh, patients are the same doctor, but. For a very, very long time, nobody noticed. Uh, so is, how did he actually kill his patients? What are some of the, the his modus operandi, so to speak? Well, his, his, his methods varied, but essentially the, the key was that he would inject them with, with a lethal uh, dose of a drug. And um, the, the drugs he used did, did vary somewhat. Uh, he, he, he would vary his approach depending on the circumstances of the patient, um, whether they were uh, living alone, as, as the vast majority were, um, whether they had close family who were keeping an eye on them. Sometimes he would uh, discover the body. Sometimes he would say that he couldn't get into the house and then get a neighbor or a relative to help him get into the house and they would discover the body together. So there are a variety of different approaches. It wasn't always precisely the same thing, but, but you can see, and, and Dame Janet saw, uh, a, a very distinct pattern of similarity uh, between the vast majority of these incidents. And this was one of the things that enabled her to pinpoint the uh, the number of murders with 
at least a reasonable degree of estimated accuracy, if you like, because, of course, he, as, as, as is sadly true of any general practitioner, any doctor, um, many of his patients died. Uh, and the question was, how many of those who died were actually people who wouldn't have died but for his um, his homicidal intervention so that was the challenge really for dame janet to to sort out the deaths and to try to categorize them and to try to see um look into the circumstances of each death she looked into an awful lot and Initially, she came up in the very first report, she came up with a figure, I think, 217, 218. And it was over time, because the, the inquiry process took several years, over time with further investigation, she came up with this rough figure of 250. It's, it's, it's just extraordinary. Um, now, there, there was definitely a pattern in, in, in who his victims were. I know you mentioned, uh, yeah. uh, I mean, they weren't all exactly identical, but I mean, the overall victim, in a nutshell, were people of a certain age, correct? They were that's, older people, that's elderly. The, that's exactly right. Um, there were one or two in the 40s, but generally the people 60 plus, ranging into the 90s. And um, I think that this is one of the critical factors about the case. And, and this is something that struck me right at the time that the story first unfolded in the late 1990s. Because, because of course, you wonder, how can anybody possibly get away with murder on this extraordinary scale? And I do think that the age profile of the victims had a great deal to do with it. I do feel the way that we as a society in Britain think of these things, and probably not just in Britain, um, was something that he took advantage of. Because I do think there's a tendency here, uh, when somebody of a certain age dies, even if it's not uh, expected, there's, there's a, a, a famous English phrase based on the game of cricket, Yeah. You, he or she had a good innings. And, and uh, uh, you know, once you've got to a certain point, it, it's not as surprising as if uh, the person who died was a younger person. I think that there was uh, a tendency on the part, certainly of the authorities, uh, certainly to some extent on the part of some of the relatives, not all, uh, uh, to think, well, it's terrible, it's, it's not what we expected, but here's a very good doctor telling us that this is what has happened and you know um uh, there it is so he says it's natural causes and and sometimes he would uh he would contrive things so that there was no question of a post-mortem he would certify uh, uh sometimes it, uh, the uh death certificate would just say died of old age something like that so it, it was pretty vague Occasionally, he would tell relatives things like, uh, well, actually, uh, it doesn't say so on the death certificate, but, but they were riddled with cancer, that sort of thing. So there was, and there, were, there was an understandable tendency on the part of everybody who's grieving, who's shocked, who has this relatively sympathetic doctor, uh, giving them reassurance that it, it was for the best. This was crazy used from time to time. And of course, it's only human nature to buy into that, particularly if you're a grieving relative. But, but the whole of society, I think, tends to uh, uh, instinctively want to buy into it. And so this, this feeling that, uh, that they died because they'd reached a certain age was absolutely fundamental to his modus operandi. It was what helped him to get away with it for so long. Yeah, I mean, that is the point um, of the, that that's the thing that really struck me the most. Um, I mean, in a nutshell, it's it's ageism. That's yeah, that's yeah. pure and simple ageism. Yeah. And I, I mean, that that really disturbed me a lot because, uh, I mean, you know, as we know, everybody's getting older, our lifespans are getting longer. Um, and to just be this dismissive about all these people dying. Well, they were old. 
you know, I mean, what's old today? You know, a yeah. hundred? I don't know what's old. Well, and, and the fact that it was just so easily dismissed, and and that that is an attitude, and it's an attitude in the medical profession as well. And and having lived in Britain, I did see it. I did see yeah. that there is this sort of dismissiveness of of yeah. older people. Um, in the states, it exists, but I I don't think it's as bad as Britain. I'm yeah. sorry to say, yeah. but yeah. Um, yeah. it is something that needs to be explored. And um, I'm I'm wondering as well has has since this shipment case, has anything actually come about in the UK to help protect people and look into this the next time it's somebody who's older who dies that it's not going to be another shipment coming along? Well, Dame Janet made numerous recommendations, um, in particular with regard to processes and procedures, uh, the way that deaths are handled in, in this country, because the, there was a feeling that he was able to certify uh, there weren't enough checks, uh, the, there weren't inquests where there might have been this kind of thing that coroners were involved from time to time, but um, by no means routinely. And so Dame Janet came up with um, a very considerable list of recommendations uh, and there has been legislation. But at the time I was writing that essay, which was about a year or so ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, some of that legislation was only just coming into force that's taken years yeah, that's uh, a long time. And, yeah and um yeah several years from the date of the recommendations being made and i think that this wider problem the ageism uh, that we've talked about i, I think that, that is still very prevalent and i think that it may be that that one of the consequences of the pandemic is that is that attitudes change, but um, but that's hard to foresee at the moment when we're right in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, so so I do think that as a society there are uh, there are real issues for us to address, and um, I, I would love to say that I, I was confident that that element of ageism and they've had a good innings is uh, is no more, but but I I think it's still very much around, and I can understand why but i do think it's uh, like like many assumptions it's um, it's worth challenging more than we do yeah absolutely. Well, I, I hope i hope more will come through from this it's just a shame it's taken so long yeah. for them to kind of wake up a bit yeah that's 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 right and and uh, the, the the title of the essay the first of criminals um comes from sherlock holmes because um of course arthur conan doyle was himself a doctor uh, and a pretty good doctor and a general practitioner. And he, so he knew about doctors and he does have Sherlock Holmes say in one of the stories, you know, when a doctor goes wrong, he is the first of criminals and he quotes various examples. Uh, and of course, through history, uh, particularly in Britain, but in many other countries as well, there are many examples of this. And that, so that struck me as um, quite an appropriate title for the essay for, for this collection, Mitzi, because um, uh, to me, in, in many ways, in, in this country, Harold Shipman really is the first of criminals. Yeah, well, let's hope there's no more Harold Shipman's yeah. coming down the line. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, in, in this, in your piece, there was um, you mentioned that okay, he, he was sort of very much uh, esteemed and 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 people swore by him. But there were also he had a sort of a, a prickly side. He had his bedside manner could be a bit abrupt and and offensive. Yeah. Yes, he, he was clearly very brusque. Um, his, his personality, is, needless to say, very complicated, but. Um, he he was clearly clearly someone who hated being challenged. He was very arrogant. I think that's absolutely uh, uh, beyond doubt. Uh, so anybody who challenged him, he really didn't like. He he was known sometimes when he was in partnership to humiliate people who worked for him, subordinate people in front of other people when uh, he, he was in a bad mood. And sometimes his his treatment um, of patients could be very offhand. And um, th there's, there's one particular case where uh, husband and wife were patients and um, uh, the minute the husband died and, and is believed to have been a murder victim, he suddenly became very callous about the deceased, very sympathetic to the uh, widow. But the widow 
then became another victim within a few weeks. So this callousness was quite astonishing. And it, it almost as if it was a form of denial. And you do wonder uh, whether his, his protestations of innocence, because, it, because he never admitted his guilt to any of the crimes, never. Uh, never offered any explanation as a result. You do wonder if he he was so good at compartmentalizing that he he had a a, a mindset uh, which enabled him to to put these crimes in one box and the the people that he'd communicated with and, and cared for and sometimes cared for well for a period of time. Uh, that that's clear, uh, and, and then once he decided that they had to go, then he, he just put any thought of them as human beings away, and that was how maybe how he rationalised it. Again, it's hard to tell; it's hard to look into such a mind, but it is, I I, th I think, really fascinating, and I I think it's a very good thing that Dame Janet did consult psychiatrists and did listen carefully to what they said and did record. Uh, those uh, observations in her report because it gives us a better chance of trying to make some sense of something which is otherwise quite unbelievable. Well, I mean, in essence, it seems as if he just he just was playing. He had a God complex. He just yeah. wanted to play God, said, OK, I'm, I think you need to die now. But you said yeah. there were also some people that basically that just got up his nose that he was annoyed yeah. by and he yeah. decided to get rid of them. Yeah. That's that's right. If you if you crossed him, um, it was um, it was not not uh, uh, not good at all. Um, he, he he was um, unpleasant in that way. Even though he he was capable of showing kindness to people, it, it was an odd mix of uh, 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 personality characteristics. But again, a reminder that that the, even somebody who might be described as a monster, you know, that their personality is quite complicated, and there are uh, that there's more to them than might meet the eye. Well, there's one one anecdote in the, in in your in your story that just um, it's 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 comical in a way. I mean, it's 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 hard to think there'd be anything funny in this. But it was when somebody had asked about a family member and in how long they might have left, and he said, "I wouldn't buy them any Easter eggs." Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and 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 that person died three or four days later. Um, that's the uh, that that sort of um pe what people put say. it down to yeah people put it down to northern bluntness but yeah yeah that's that's astonishing really when you think about it uh that that degree of uh, bluntness but but pe people accepted it um quite astonishing because he was this authority figure he'd been around in the area in the town for a long time 20 years or more uh, and people trusted him implicitly. God, now we're going to start thinking it's thinking twice about uh, Doc Martin. <laughs> I mean, he's pretty brusque and abrupt and yeah. all those things. Yes, you just, uh, you just never know, do you? It's very, very extraordinary. Oh, my God. Um, you know, when people ask about the book, you know, like if, if someone interviews me about the book and they'll say, well, you know, what do you want to say about this story or that story? And, and, and you know, when I, when I reference your story, I, I mention about how that as fiction writers, we're, our job is the suspension of disbelief. Yeah. Now, as you write so much fiction, yeah. if you wrote Shipman as a piece of fiction, I mean, <laughs> who, would, who would swallow that? Absolutely, absolutely, and, and the way that he uh, he was discovered because he forged a patient's will, and the uh, patient, uh, her daughter, was a solicitor, the <laughs> last person you want to uh, try to disinherit <laughs> in inexplicable circumstances, almost as if he wanted to to be caught. But again, the uh, psychologically very complicated. But again, the sort of thing if you put that in a novel. I put that in in one of my novels. It'd be very, very difficult to uh, uh, persuade people that it was remotely credible, but but it actually happened. Stop. Yeah, see, the, 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 the CWA would want their diamond back. Their diamond. Doctor <laughs> <laughs> Martin, what's he trying to do? <laughs> Oh my God! I, I know it's just it's just totally crazy that I mean. Well, again, the, the cliche "truth is stranger than fiction" is certainly yeah. true with with uh, Doctor Shipman. Um, it really is. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned earlier on that he took a couple of breaks yes. in his killing career. 
Yes, it, it, it may be. Again, it's difficult to weigh up, but it, it um, first one was pretty early and it was when he was uh, uh, establishing himself. Uh, later on, may have been prompted by um, an anxiety that um, he was in danger of being caught. Uh, but but then the the lure of the crime uh, seems to have drawn him back. Again, hard to tell. Dame Janet speculates a bit, but I, I think she doesn't speculate excessively. I think the speculation is actually if I may say so, very, very, very intelligent and, and very um, constructive because, because the purpose of this inquiry was to learn lessons and there are all sorts of lessons to learn, not just in terms of legislation and what happens when a person dies, but what can we learn about the, uh, the personality makeup of people who, who attempted to do such terrible things and what are the warning signs we might, we might look out for and possibly detect? Yeah, yeah. It's just, uh, I don't know, it's just beyond belief, this whole thing. Um, as far as um, Dr. Shipman, now he, he was actually, he did get sentenced, correct? And he was imprisoned. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. was his sentence out of curiosity? Do you know offhand? Uh, it, it was uh, life, life sentence multiplied uh, uh, by a number of times. And it was pretty clear that um, under the uh, British legislation, the way that it works, he would be one of the relatively small number of murderers who would never be released. Uh, it's called a whole life term. And right. it, it, it was clearly unimaginable that somebody committed so many crimes and hadn't admitted it and hadn't uh, reconciled himself to the reality would never be released. and and. No doubt that that was uh, uh, the impetus to suicide once he was uh, uh, convicted and, and faced up to reality for once in his life. But um, but it, it was clear that that no Home Secretary it would be inconceivable that uh, any, any Home Secretary would want to release such a, such a killer. I'll put him back out there to practice medicine again. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah. so um, how long was he actually, do you know offhand how long he was actually physically in prison before he topped himself? Oh, it, it was only a short time. It well, was only a very short time, yeah. Wow, yeah. wow. So he certainly, well, I guess I suppose, <laughs> yeah, what, what's left at that point unless he, you know, I mean, was he in the base, in the regular prison population or did he uh, have to be kept on he, his own? He would have been kept, he would have been kept separately. Yeah. I, I don't know the precise de or I can't recall the precise details, but uh, he, he, he would have he, he would have been uh, yeah there would have been a suicide watch, but of course you can't guard against everything, and um, clearly they didn't. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I, I'm I'm sure a lot of the victims' families would have liked to have seen him at least pay for his crimes instead of taking uh, the easy and, way out, and indeed give some sort of explanation. There's a bit yeah. of possibility of closure there, but but. Uh, and that, I think, is one of the great benefits of Dame Janet's report, and it's one of the reasons why I've laid such stress on it in, in my essay, that I think that report really is very helpful. It's, uh, um, it's an admirable uh, piece of work, I think, and um, I, I'm, I'm very impressed with the diligence with which she carried it out, because, because one does sometimes read reports in my other life I've I've been a lawyer, so I'm I'm familiar with them, and and this is an absolute model of its kind, in my opinion. Wow. Very, very well, yeah, I mean, the first of criminals is quite a quite a fascinating read. So uh, definitely, uh, I <laughs> you but if you get the book, you've got to read that one. Um, so, in closing, I wanted to ask you if you uh, do you have anything that you're working on right now, or anything new you'd like to tell us about. Yes, well, I'm, I'm working on a new book in my Late District Mysteries series. Um, I'm shortly bringing out a book that I've edited called How Done It, which is about the art and craft of crime writing by members of the Detection Club, from Ian Rankin to John le Carre. Wow. And my most recent, not yes, it's exciting. Yeah. Uh, it's it's going to be a great book. And my most recent published novel is, is a book called Mort Main Hall, which is the second in the series uh, featuring Rachel Savonake and uh, Jacob Flint. It's set in 1930. And it's a kind of love letter to golden age 
detective fiction. And um, I have the uh, the book right here. This is the uh, the English book. Uh, the American edition is going to be published in September. And today, this very day, I had the very exciting experience of reading a review by A. N. Wilson. Uh, one of Britain's leading novelists who uh, gave it a rave review. So, uh, so I'm in very happy mood about Mortmain Hall, uh, even as we speak, because that was uh, that was hugely gratifying, I must say. So well, that's that, that's great. It's a novel I've really enjoyed uh, writing, and I've been thrilled by the reaction and the and the reviews so far. So, um, yeah, so uh, Mortmain Hall is uh, definitely a personal favourite amongst my own books. Well, they're very good for the pandemic to be home and reading these great crime books. Thanks, Nancy. <laughs> Highly recommend doing that to everybody. You, you know, just stay home constantly, you know, just read, buy books, you know, Absolutely. that's all you need to do. <laughs> your local bookshop and indeed your local authors. Yes, exactly. And don't forget the independent booksellers as well. You sure. know, yeah. 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 Yeah, well, I, I'm so glad you were able to join us today. Um, this is actually going, this is actually the last um, uh, Facebook Live event I'm doing with a contributor for for the best new true crime story, Serial Killers. And because uh, I got to move on to my next book, which is the best yeah. new true crime story, Small Towns. So I'll be starting again with some of those writers. Unfortunately, Martin's not in that book, but maybe Martin will show up later on in another book. Who knows? Well, I'm, I'm really grateful to have been asked. And, and it, of course, it gave me the chance to look into this fascinating case in a lot more depth. So uh, so it's so kind of you to approach me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, this, the stuff of nightmares, right, Dr. Shipman? <laughs> So again, to everyone listening, I've been uh, chatting with Martin Edwards. Uh, his story is the first of criminals about uh, the notorious Dr. Harold Shipman. Uh, thank you again, Martin, and uh, stay thank well you. and stay healthy. And the same to you. And thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. -bye.